Well, enough talk about poles and signs and snow and ice. Before we begin our look at Daniel 10 today, please join me in prayer, won't you? Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. It is how you have revealed yourself to us. It's how you have spoken to us. It's how you speak to us today. Help us to always rightly handle your word. Help us, Lord, to gain wisdom of your word, understanding, increase all those things in us. Let us not just be hearers of the word, but let us be courageous doers of the word also. Every day this world is falling further and further away from you, and it hates your word. It is at war with your word. Let us never be at war with your word, but help us to, like children, faithfully believe in it. But give us courage to defend it and to share it. Be with us today as we read your word, Lord. Use it to sharpen us and make us more like Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. This is Daniel 10. This is Daniel's vision of a man. And uh, he says this in the first verse. In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth. Nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. This is, uh, chapter 10 is kind of a setup for chapter 11, so to speak. And here it's telling us that uh, this is in the third year of Cyrus, and by this time, the first wave of exiles would have returned to Jerusalem under the leadership of Ezra. You can read that in Ezra 1 and 2. We see here that, uh, and if you're looking for Ezra in your Old Testament, it would be after 2 Chronicles and before Nehemiah. Uh, it says the message was true. So this vision that Daniel gets is true. What the information he's going to get from this is true. But the appointed time for this message is long. It's long. It's going to take a while. Daniel 10 sets the stage for the spectacular message that we're going to see in Daniel 11. And in Daniel 11, it describes a time of great persecution and testing for the people of Israel. He says that he is mourning for three full weeks. Some people think that he was mourning, Daniel, that he was mourning because of so few Jews returning with Ezra from exile. Others believe it was because Ezra faced severe opposition in rebuilding the temple. Daniel didn't go back with Ezra's group. He didn't go back with those first exiles because at this time he would have been around 84 years old. That's old, especially in that time. Daniel could have served the exiles better from his position of authority in the government than he could have in Jerusalem. So he stayed where he was. Perhaps his heart wanted to go there and go back. But he looked at what was better for his people and how he could better glorify and serve God and chose to stay there. Spurgeon said this, he says, I think that Daniel's sorrow was partly by the repetition of those words to him that the vision is true, but the time appointed is long. He said, I ate no pleasant food, nor meat or wine came into my mouth. This isn't fasting then. He's not fasting. He's, he's still eating. He's not, he's not abstaining from food altogether here. This is more like self-denial than it was fasting. But it is to highlight his state of his heart. His mourning. Verse 4 in Daniel 10. Daniel's going to see a, a, something glorious on the banks of the Tigris River. He says... In verse 4, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Upaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze. And the sound of his words was like the sound of a multitude. A certain man clothed in linen. There are multiple viewpoints on who this man is, the identity of this 
man. Some say that it is Jesus, noting the description and how it's very similar it is to that which John saw in the book of Revelation in the first chapter. A certain man clothed in linen. Some others think that this certain man is an unnamed angel of high rank. Noting that further along in this chapter, you'll notice that this person says that they needed the assistance of Michael down in the 13th verse. And Jesus would not need the assistance of Michael. He's Jesus. He's God. So some commentators look at that and say, so this could not be Jesus. We also know that Ezekiel saw angelic figures clothed in linen, according to Ezekiel 9. So there's a couple different ways you could look at that. I don't know which way is right. I don't know which one it is. I have hunches, I have guesses. You'll, you'll hear that as we go along. His body was like Beryl. The messenger whom Daniel sees in this vision was distinct from the angel Michael that's going to be mentioned later, so we know it's not him. This glorious description does lead us to think that it might be Christ in a pre-incarnate appearance, a theopiphany, if you will, like you see in Joshua 5, or like you see in, with Gideon in the book of Judges. There is that very similar description that we mentioned in Revelation 1 that John gave. Maybe it was a pre-incarnate vision of Christ. Maybe it was an angel. Maybe it was a pre-incarnate vision of Christ at one point, and then later on it was an angel. Verse 7, let's keep reading. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So there's something supernatural about this vision. Daniel is the only one who sees it. His companions or whoever is around him see nothing. Yet a great trembling falls upon them and they sense the urge to flee and hide themselves. This is like similar to what happened with Saul on the road to Damascus, right? We remember that story. His companions could not hear the same voice that Saul heard. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? This reminds us that we can be close to the presence and the power of God, yet miss it. The, there were men with Saul on the road to Damascus, and there were people around Daniel in this vision who were close to a supernatural working of the Lord, but had no clue. They couldn't perceive it. God didn't allow them to. They fled to hide themselves. And of course, you can't see anything if you flee to hide from it. Verse 8. So I was left alone, and I saw this great vision. And what was their reaction? There was no strength left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. As godly and righteous as Daniel was, he stood for his faith. God strengthened his faith and allowed him to be able to stand. As godly as Daniel was, he is undone by what he sees. He is, he, he, he is face down on the ground, undone. This, I think this points to it being Christ, a pre-incarnate vision of Christ, because this is how John reacts in the presence of Christ, face down, on the ground. This is John, the apostle whom Jesus loved, and he has a vision where he's brought up into the third heaven, and he sees Christ, and his reaction isn't chest bumps and high fives. It is a falling onto his face as if dead, filled with fear, until Jesus lifts, his, lifts him up. And we have a similar thing happening here. And this goes to show us that even the holiest of men or the most godly of men or women, if you're in the presence of God, that's what happens. Even if you're a close associate, you will fall on your face by the overwhelming glory of God. He says, my vigor or my strength was turned to frailty. Like a, uh, 
The idea is like a death-like paleness. Your color leaves you. You're, you're stunned. You're gobsmacked. You're, you're awestruck. You have a, uh, the idea of like all your color leaving you and a facial expression of, of, I don't know what's going on right now. I'm completely overwhelmed. That kind of thing. If I was to tell you that, that if I just describe it to you that way, you might not think of this as a great experience and you wouldn't necessarily raise your hand and say, I want to go through that too. <laughs> oh, I want to go through that too. I want to have all my color leave my body. I want my face to contort because I'm overwhelmed and I want to fall on my face as if dead. Right? That doesn't sound like a great experience to go through. But I think it is. We're just not prepared for the holiness of God and the glory of God and what it's like to be in His presence. Even as godly of a man as Daniel was at 84 years old, having lived through all the things he had lived through and stood for the Lord faithfully all that time, that was his reaction when confronted to the presence of God. We can't get too far ahead of ourselves, right? All the wonderful, gracious things that God has done for us the way he has adopted us into his family and made us full heirs with Christ does not mean that we will not react the exact same way that Daniel did. Verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. This is at at the point where I would say, perhaps you had a vision, Daniel, and you're seeing Christ on the riverbank, right? A description of him very similar to how John describes him in Revelation 1. And the reaction that he has to, to seeing that, right? Very similar to John's reaction to seeing Christ, right? But now, all of a sudden, it seems like there's a chance. And again, I don't I don't know if I'm right here. But it seems as though you're, at one point you're talking about Christ on the bank and then all of a sudden this is a, a change. There's a change. Let me just continue reading and you'll see what I'm talking about. A hand touched me. He was, Daniel's laid out. He's in weakness by this experience and then he's touched by a hand and he's strengthened. Okay, He's still trembling, but he's strengthened. A hand touches me. Don't forget that in Daniel 8 that Gabriel was used by the Lord, the angel Gabriel, to interpret what Daniel was seeing. And so this is a very likely Gabriel who is, again, being used by the Lord to interpret what Daniel is seeing. I think that this is a good chance that, that it's both. So when people say, oh, it was an angel on the riverbank, oh, it was Jesus, well, why can't... It be both. Why can't it be Jesus on the riverbank and then an angel who comes up and touches him and then begins to speak to him and speak to him in a way where he's talking about how he needs help from another angel and and see what I'm saying? That's where I land in my study, at least for now. (laughs) Don't forget, like I said, Gabriel was the one who interpreted the revelations to Daniel. He also spoke similarly about Daniel being beloved by God. Oh, Daniel, man greatly loved. That's the second time Daniel was called greatly beloved or greatly loved. It was in Daniel 9, verse 23, last time previous to this. And each time it was in relation to Daniel being favored with a great and significant revelation of the future. So it makes sense that this could be Gabriel in Daniel 9 and Gabriel again here in Daniel 10. Stand up. It's time for Daniel to hear and understand. Time to get up. Get your head straight. Verse 12. Then he said to me, this is who we believe to be Gabriel. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. 
and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for the days yet to come. So this is telling us that God responded to Daniel's prayer the very moment he made his request known. Daniel had been in great and serious prayer for three weeks, according to the second verse that we just read minutes ago. He has come because of your words. God commanded this angel Gabriel to come to Daniel because of Daniel's prayer. An angel was dispatched because of Daniel's prayer. This is very encouraging. If I just stop at this point and say, this is very encouraging because it tells us that our God is very attentive, that he listens to prayer, that he hears us, that when you pray as a faithful one who has been saved by God, from God, for God, that he will hear your prayers, that you're not just speaking to nothing, but you're speaking out and praying to a God who is and who shows that he hears. Your words are heard. Isn't that encouraging? Shake your heads up and down. Yes, yes it is. Does prayer matter? Absolutely. This is, a, this is a great reminder, and there's many reminders in the book of Daniel that prayer matters. It matters. It's not just a therapeutic exercise. It's not, it's not just a, something that you're going to do to, to make yourself feel better. It's not just a therapeutic exercise. It is commanded by God and used by God for his glory and for our blessing. On top of that, just to give you some verses about praying. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. That's a command. To pray without ceasing. It does not mean that you should go buy a brown snuggle and put it on and walk around like a monk chanting and praying 24-7, 365. That is not what pray without ceasing means. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, when it says pray without ceasing, it just means pray all the time. In all things, Pray. Things are going good, pray. Things are going bad, pray. Things are going in between, pray. Need something, pray. Scared about something, pray. Make prayer like breathing. Where it's your first, it's not your last resort, it's the first thing you do. In all things, pray. Pray without ceasing. Maybe you say, makes sense to me. Yes, you're right, I should pray more. Yes, but I just don't know how to pray. What if I mess it up? What if I say something that I shouldn't say? Or what if I don't say something that I should have said? Here's your, here's your, here's your relief from that. Romans 8, 26. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. <laughs> for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Even if you do have a strong prayer life, you don't necessarily know exactly what you need and you're not going to be able to necessarily always be praying for what it is you need in the future that you don't know is coming. You see what I'm saying? Or maybe you just don't think of it and you miss something or, or whatever, right? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. God, I'm not good at praying. God, I might have forgotten about praying for something for myself or I might not know something that's coming and I want to be equipped for it, right? Right? For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but, here's the good part, the Spirit Himself, this is God, the Holy Spirit, Himself intercedes for us. He fills in the gaps. He makes up for anything that you might have missed. He knows what's coming. He knows that you just prayed how you need help with, uh, you know, uh, patience with your neighbor. And He knows that, that you just prayed for help with uh, patience with your family member. But he also knows that in two months' time, something else is coming down the pipeline that you need to be trained up for. And you don't know that. And so guess what? God the Holy Spirit prays on your behalf. He intercedes on your my behalf. How wonderful is that? You can't even screw up prayer. You can't screw up your salvation. You can't screw up prayer either. Because God has made sure that he has covered all the bases. Isn't that great? Prayer matters. But even if you stink up a prayer, or you, me not good words, Lord, me not know what pray. 
God will intercede. He'll fill in all the gaps. Oh, I want my son to be saved. I want my daughter to be saved. I want my family to be saved. We don't know necessarily what the roadblocks are to their salvation. God's Spirit does. And He will pray and intercede in the ways that we miss or in the ways that we're not aware of. How about another one? James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. Is it worthwhile to pray? Yes. We're told to. We're told to. Or Ephesians 6, 18. Pray at all times in the Spirit. That's very similar to 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray at all times in the Spirit. It goes on to say, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Again, command to pray. 1 Timothy 2. I urge that supplications, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for all kings and all those in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Pray. Pray. This angel, who we believe to be Gabriel, tells Daniel that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him. Since this prince is able to oppose Gabriel, we know that this must be more than a man. So when it says the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is not a man we're talking about. A man can't stop an angel. Or a fallen angel. This prince was some kind of an angelic being. An evil angelic being because he's opposing the word of God coming to Daniel. So this prince of Persia is an evil angel opposing who we believe is Gabriel coming to Daniel to expose what the word of God that has been shared to him means. That's how we know that this is a bad angel. An evil angel, because he's trying to stop God's angelic messenger. The idea of the word prince is one who is a ruler or an authority. We have evidence through the scripture that there are angelic ranks organized with a form of hierarchy. So this is, there's a hierarchy within the holy angels and there's a hierarchy within the fallen angels. And one of the fallen angels of high rank is opposing this answer to prayer and keeping Gabriel from getting to Daniel. So there's this three-week delay. Remember, Daniel's praying really earnestly for three weeks. Oh, he's praying so hard. And there's a delay, and this delay was due to, because remember, Gabriel said, from the moment that your prayer left your lips, God told me to go. Right? So what, what was the delay? Well, the delay is due to an evil, evil angel opposing Gabriel. This is heavenly warfare. It is going on all around us all the time. A spiritual battle constantly. I think if, if, if the veil was torn back and you could see the spiritual battle that was going on all around us all the time, I think we would be a lot more serious about our lives for Christ. This angel was um, trying to thwart the work of God. We know that that won't be, right? No, no fallen angel, Satan himself, can't stop God's will. So God allowed this to happen this way. He allowed it to happen this way for his good will and purpose. But this, this little story here shows us that, there, that Satan engages in spiritual warfare to stop and try and delay and try and do anything he can to thwart God's plan for his people. You had a, a reference to Michael. Uh, he is regarded as the chief angel in heaven. And he's the one who comes to help out Gabriel. He withstood me 21 days this evil angel. Since the angel was dispatched, dispatched immediately after Daniel's prayer and self-denial, we see that this evil angel succeeded in delaying. 
But wherever there's a success with the kingdom of evil, it is only because God has allowed it. Okay? Don't, don't start thinking that this is God versus Satan, holy angels versus evil angels, and it's a 50-50 battle, and boy, we just hope that in the end, maybe Satan will slip on a banana peel and Jesus will get a lucky uppercut and he'll win 51-49. to 49. Like, that is not at all. It is 100 to 0, our sovereign Lord, every time. So if there's ever what seems to be evil winning, it's only because God has allowed it in his purposeful plan. Never because, oh no, he got overwhelmed. Do you see? Never. So we have hope and assurance and encouragement no matter what is going on. Even when it seems like this world all around us is falling deeper and deeper into the clutches of Satan and his worldly system, this is our Father's world. Since there was an angelic victory, we can surmise that Daniel's prayer was effective. It was effective because God immediately sends out an angel, and it's effective because the angels end up winning. They didn't win because of Daniel's prayer, they won because of God. But Daniel's prayer was a part of all that. Our prayers matter. You might pray to God and ask for something, and it doesn't get immediately answered. Why? Well, maybe it's not God's will. Or maybe it's not God's time. Maybe it's God's will, but it's not his time. Or maybe God has a better plan than you and I do, and he's using all these things to accomplish his perfect will. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, this angel who we believe is Gabriel said. In other passages, Michael is associated with the battle between good and evil, Revelation 12, Jude 9. This angel who we believe to be Gabriel said, he came to help me. This is one of the most compelling reasons to think that this me is not Jesus. Because obviously Jesus would not need help. He is plenty strong enough. He's the all-powerful creator. Even though there's that similarity that in the description in the first part of Daniel 10. That's why I... I'm really leaning towards thinking that the the vision is of Jesus, but the person who comes to touch Daniel and starts speaking to him like we've been reading in these last few verses is someone different, that it's Gabriel. The same angel that God sent to speak to him in Daniel 9 has been sent again to speak to him yet again and inform him on what this vision he has seen means and that God heard his prayer. I do acknowledge that Jesus received angelic help when he was an incarnate man, right? The angels came and ministered to him after he told Satan to go take a hike. After being tempted in the wilderness. He tells Satan, go take a hike, and then he's ministered to by angels. So, yes, Jesus received angelic assistance while he was incarnate. But it is very difficult to think of him needing any kind of assistance before his incarnation. This is why I've come to what I believe for this interpretation. So Gabriel goes on to say, now I have come. God allows this kind of conflict and thing to happen because he has a plan, a purpose for allowing it. God is not just um, reckless. He is not a reckless God. He is not a fly-by-the-seat-of-his-pants kind of guy. No, 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 no. No, if if something is happening, it's because God is allowing it and he's purposing it and he is using it. When I go through hardships and stuff, I remind myself of that. Snowblower, you broke down again for the third time and and the three times I've tried to use you, you've broke down every single time. I'm about ready to pitch you into the lake. But then you remind yourself, well, God has a plan. God has a reason. I don't know why, I don't know what, but I have faith and trust that he has a plan and he has a reason. Maybe he's teaching me patience with inanimate objects. I'm much better with people than I am with inanimate objects. Ask my wife. Or maybe not. Don't ask her. More I'm thinking about that, yeah. 
But no, it, so why is he doing that? I don't know, maybe it's because then I, have, I ended up talking to my brother-in-law and he's come by and I'm talking to him about something else and that, that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for that breaking down or maybe, who knows, right? I don't know. All I know is I'm confident that God uses everything for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And that he's going to use everything for his glory and he's going to use everything for my good. And sometimes my good includes pain and difficulty. Just like when a parent disciplines their child. You don't, a good parent doesn't discipline their child because they think that um, they want to crush their child. No, they're trying to teach the child that there's consequences to poor decisions or, or bad actions. There, so sometimes there is, that is being done as a correction. Sometimes it's being done just as a learning experience, a refining moment. I don't know. When I get to heaven, I'll be like, Lord, what was that for? Oh, okay. Hey, Lord, what was that for? Oh, yeah. Right, we'll know and be fully known. I'll understand everything then. For now, I just have a childlike faith and say, snowblower, ah, thank you, Lord, for teaching me patience with the snowblower. What again? But he says, now I have come. God allowed all that conflict, but he also allowed for that conflict to come to an end so that Daniel could be reached by Gabriel. You, you could think of it like this. Why did God allow that delay? Well, it could have certainly... Look, God at any time can just blast away demons whenever he wants. Right? Any opposition that any created being has to the, the creator is nil. He could have blasted them away any time. So why did God allow this 21-day delay? Maybe to strengthen Daniel's prayer. You think of that? Maybe to, to show Daniel that, yeah, you really are completely dependent upon me. There's lots of reasons. Persistence in prayer is not necessary because God is reluctant and that he needs to be overcome. It's not like God was sitting up in a heavenly armchair going, what's that, Daniel? Ugh, it's Daniel again. Ugh. What's on channel 42? You know, God's not doing that. God is not up there reluctantly waiting, needing to be prodded by us via prayer. That... It, Prayer and, and the delay to the answer to prayer is necessary sometimes to train us. To train us. Why is God allowing me to go through this? To train me. Why has God let that happen? To train you. To break you, to train you, to refine you. All good things in the big picture. Hard to see in the midst of it. But given some separation and some time, you can look back on difficult circumstances in your life and see how God has used that to train you and refine you. The same idea would be when God asks questions in the Bible, right? Anytime, think of Jesus and his earthly ministry. He would ask people questions, right? Who do the people say I am? He knew, right? He knew. Anytime God asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> he knows the answer. Anytime Jesus asked a question, it wasn't because he didn't know the answer. He knew the answer. He's the omniscient God. He knows all. So in the same way, it's like when God asks questions in the Bible, he already knows the answer. He's looking to train us. He's looking to train us. That's what he's doing. What will happen to your people in the latter days? That's what this vision that's coming up is all about. Verse 15, when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips, and then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O Lord, O my Lord, by reason of the vision pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and in good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Daniel started on the ground, and then he stood up, and now he's back on his face again. <laughs> this is so real, right? This is, this, is, this is what it's like, right? You stand up. You're on the ground. You stand up again. Oh, you're back on the ground. Now you stand up again. Uh, that's, that's what life is like, right? 
as we are going through it and God is working in our lives, sometimes it's the time to be on your face and other times it's time to stand. And then there's times where you try and stand, you're back on your face. He says, because the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, is what he's saying. A writhing kind of pain. Sorrow here is a, is a writhing, twisting kind of pain. What he's seeing is having that effect on him. It's also linked to the idea of the pain of childbirth. So what Daniel's saying here is that everything I'm seeing, that you are about to tell me what the meaning of, of it is, is having this effect on me. I can barely breathe. I've lost all strength. I've got my face on the ground. I'm, I can't even function. I can't <coughs> breathe. I am twisted and writhing in pain because of what I'm seeing. I can't possibly even deal with the prophetic consequences of all this right now. Like... I can't. I am not ready, right? So then he is touched and he is strengthened so that he can do that. So that he can be in a place to understand the interpretation of what he has seen. One having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me, that's, that's the angel. God's intermediary. God, the, the messengers to us. The ministering spirit that God sends and when he does this, he receives strength. The, the idea here is to set the stage, right? We haven't even read what the vision is yet. We haven't gotten to that point yet, right? We're just talking about Daniel's reaction to it. It's setting the stage. It is such an overwhelming thing that he has this kind of traumatic reaction to it. Get it? That's what is being set. That's the stage that's being set for us right now. Verse 20, then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. This is a, an evil angel contesting for the kingdom of Greece in the same way that there was an evil angel contesting for the kingdom of Persia. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. So Daniel was about to receive the answer to his prayer, but the battle's not over for this heavenly messenger. He's going to have to go back to battle with the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. In a larger sense, God watching out for Israel, working behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. We have no idea what's going on. Do you understand how, how, how blind we really are? We don't have any clue to the, to the greatness of what God is doing behind the scenes for us. We, you can understand his grace and his mercy and his salvation and his, and his substitutionary atonement on the cross for us and the giving of his righteousness. You can understand that to a point, okay? But we don't really understand it in the same way we will when we get to heaven. We'll have full understanding there. But everything that's going on behind the scenes, that's why, it, look, there's no way, there's so many what ifs, right? I've met many people in my lives where it's like, yes, I, I believe in God, but... What about this? What if this? What if that? What if this? What if that? There's a millions, in, in, immeasurable number of what ifs. Okay? You will never be able to contemplate it all. You'll never be able to answer it all. This is where the childlike faith comes in. That God's got all this stuff handled. Before you ever understood what substitutionary atonement was, God had it handled. Before you ever knew what grace was, unmerited favor, guess what? God had it handled. Before you knew what salvation was and your need for a Savior, guess what? God had it handled. Before you knew anything that's going on in your life right now that you see as a spiritual battle, guess what? God was already well aware of it, equipping you, training you, sending His messengers to help you. I mean, He's, he's got everything handled. There is no reason to fear. Fear is natural. It comes upon us, right? But we deal with it as ones who have total faith in our God that He handles everything. He's got everything handled. He is always watching out for his people and working behind the scenes for our benefit and for his glory. Always. Always. No exception. So then I have full trust and faith in him, no matter what's going on, that he's in control, that he hasn't ceded that control and he never will. There is heavenly warfare that is going on all around us. We don't want to be neutral. We want to be on God's side. 
Michael is the angelic guardian of Israel. He is the one mentioned, when no one holds me against these except Michael, your prince. So Michael is the angelic guardian of Israel. So if you say there's a, uh, an angel over or a prince over Persia, there's a prince over Greece, Michael would be the holy angel or the holy prince over Israel. And this angel who we think is Gabriel says, Michael is the one who is helping me battle these demonic representatives of Persia and Greece. God, is, God has a plan for every nation and every person. And he will make sure that it comes to perfect fruition. God is at work in all of human history. By his own hand and using the hands of the angels that he has created to do his will. On earth, Israel seems lowly and weak, right? Especially at this point in the story, in Daniel 10, Israel seems lowly, Israel seems weak. But in the heavens, it had the mightiest representation of all. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all for Israel. And the mighty Prince Michael for Israel. So even though it seemed lowly and weak, Behind the scenes, in the spiritual realm, it was very strong. Yes? Unconquerably strong. Thanks to God. And so it is with us. And this is where we end today. This is how it is with us. We, too, seem weak and lowly to the world. Biblical Christianity, biblical Christians, seem lowly and weak to the world. But... Our advocate, defender, husband, king, lord, God is, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit himself. They call us precious. Do you see what I'm trying to say? This time, Israel seems to the world's eyes lowly and weak. But if you pulled back the curtain and could see things spiritually, you would see that they had the mightiest angel and they had the, no less than the Lord himself on their side. Even though to the world, Israel's, what's Israel? It had to get permission to even go back to Jerusalem, right? Seems so lowly and weak, but that's just to the world's eyes. It's the same for us today, church. We seem to the world lowly and weak. But if you could pull back the curtain and see with spiritual eyes, you would see that that is not the case at all. We are the ones that Christ gave his life for, we are his bride. Only a fool would mess with the bride of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Please pray with me. Father, as we close our setup to the vision that we'll be reading of next time in Daniel 11, we are made aware that there is a whole other world that we cannot see where your holy angels that serve you faithfully are ministering to us and helping us and fulfilling your will. And there are fallen angels who are trying to resist your will, trying to tempt us and, and uh, bring us into despair and undo your will. But this is a fruitless endeavor. No one can ever overcome you or your will. Let us be encouraged by the fact that you are, have everything covered. We read this today and we say, that's right, that's right, I remember. There are angels and there is an angel, spiritual warfare going on and stuff. And... Last night, we weren't even thinking about that. And now we are thinking about it. It's in the forefront of our minds, and we realize, wow, God, you have everything covered, don't you? Every possible and conceivable angle you have covered. Every one of our needs you have made sure to meet in and through Christ Jesus. Let us find complete rest in that and rest in peace in the truth that we just were talking about, that we are the bride of Christ I know if anybody tried to mess with my bride that they'd have to deal with me. And so, Lord, if that's how I feel, how many millions times greater is it that you feel protective and, and caring for your bride, the church, of which we are thanks to Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, and him alone. We thank you for this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.